Hello, Startup Vision. Uh, my name is TM Ravi. I'm the founder and managing director of The Hive, a venture capital and venture studio based in Silicon Valley in California. Hello, Ravi. Thank you so much for being with us on Startup Vision TV today. So you're the co-founder of The Hive in the heart of Silicon Valley, you just said it. And uh, you invest, The Hive invest in AI and data-driven uh, startups. C can you explain the concept of this venture studio? So the, the venture studio is a particular kind of venture capital entity where in addition to funding companies, we are also very operationally active in these companies. So a, a vast majority of these companies, uh, we have been involved in starting them. So think about a venture studio as being like a co-creation studio of, of companies. And we collaborate with entrepreneurs who are often founders and have domain expertise, but also sometimes with corporations who, who have market expertise. So using this model since 2012, We've done 28 companies. We've had one IPO, Pinterest, uh, a number of exits, and we are in our fourth fund, the uh, high four. Yeah, meaning, in fact, from what I saw, you know, in our discussion, you, you start from a need very often from corporations, and then you achieve what they, what they need, in fact. Yeah, so we, we really flesh out, you know, there's a lot of change happening in the market and customers are, 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 are driving this change. So, so there are a lot of white spaces that are emerging in different market spaces. And corporations have a very good understanding of those white spaces, but they lack the agility and the innovation to be able to go grab and dominate it. So many of those corporations are partners of the hive and we leverage that knowledge to go and create companies in different areas. You also propose uh, what you called Euclid. It's a very forward thinking concept, providing an easy to use platform uh, to include AI more quickly into startups. Can we talk about that? So all our companies are leveraging data and using uh, different approaches of AI. But, but the Hive really focuses on companies that deliver applications and end outcomes. So, so what we don't want them to do is each of them kind of reinvent the wheel every time. And, and so the Hive uh, provides a framework or a platform, as, as you mentioned, Euclid, that is an AI platform. So it has everything from data ingestion and data management, computer vision, machine learning, deep learning, and so on, so that we can share this across the companies and accelerate their, their product uh, uh, you know, development times. Yeah, it's, it's huge because you, know, you, you allow them to, to grow uh, much more rapidly. I mean, it's uh, time saved uh, all across the board. And, and leverage sort of best practices because someone who is an expert in the healthcare or industrial space is not necessarily an AI technology expert and the choices they may make uh, may be wrong. So put them on kind of a, a, a higher pedestal. Okay, so we're talking about AI and that's your core experience. So what is your vision of an AI and digital world, let's say in 10 years and then in 20 years from now? How do you see that? <laughs> uh, it's a big question. So in, in, in the next 10 years, I would say, uh, you'll see the use of data and AI driving kind of the transformation, digital transformation of enterprises. And that primarily falls in two categories. Enterprises will deliver more and more digitally oriented products and services. So what they sell to customers, even if it's a kind of a traditional pump or, or, or a physical thing, will always have a digital experience. The second area uh, as part of digital transformation is making kind of workflows and processes, the operations of a company much more automated, much more streamlined. So that's in the next 10 years. And I see largely the impact being on the enterprise. Uh, the next 20 years, 
I, th I think you'll, you'll see a sort of impact on, on our lives. You know, um, you, you'll see kind of uh, dramatic kind of improvement and changes in, in life sciences, you know, personalized drugs using advanced machine learning, genomics. Um, you know, you're, you're already beginning to see sort of autonomous vehicles. But probably the, the big change we will see uh, in the workplace is going to be around sort of how kind of a lot of knowledge work. You know, in the past generation, physical work started getting automated. And you will see a lot of knowledge work getting automated so that uh, people who are working in companies are very focused on major big decision making and creativity. So it's really going to drive uh, a change in, in, in the way sort of we work. So you're very positive about it, of course. Yes, yes, so we, are, we are bullish. You know, we, are not, we are not sort of, hey, machines are gonna take over the world in the next 25 years, but, but we see a, 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 a fairly kind of fast pace of, of change happening. And also you see AI as an extended uh, intelligence, uh, uh, an augmented intelligence instead of uh, totally artificial and, uh, and maybe negative. As and augmenting kind of people, allowing them to, to have you know, more superpowers and allowing them to, to be more productive and more creative. So your everyday task is dealing with the future, as we saw, you know, AI, 5G, blockchain, et cetera. So to your knowledge and analysis up to that point, you know, what country will be the leader uh, in the world of the world in tech, let's say in the coming years? What do you think? If you, if you think about it, you know, the previous sort of um, generation, um, you know, Europe, US were technology leaders. And, and there is something kind of uh, an interesting phenomenon around that. The people who are leaders and early adopters of technology in one generation end up with a lot of legacy, a lot of sort of investment, a lot of debt, technical debt and process debt around that technology. And as the technology changes, it gives people who didn't embrace that technology, who are not leaders in that technology, an opportunity to kind of leapfrog. And, and so I see a lot of exciting development happening in Asia and uh, around sort of the technologies you mentioned. Take, for example, 5G. The adoption of 5G in Asia is, is, is just moving much more faster. And, and so I see a kind of more balanced sort of uh, next sort of generation between Europe, uh, North America, Asia. One, one point I did want to make here also is that you are seeing some corporations, technology corporations, have nation state like powers, you know, who are, who are basically like think about the Googles and the Facebooks and Microsofts and Amazons. There are a number of customers, their geographical reach, um, their revenue. They're really, you know, is putting them in kind of the top 10, top 15 kind of countries. And, and it's a very interesting phenomenon. So go, go a little bit further with that, because this is very interesting. You're right. It's not, um, it couldn't be a, a race between countries, but it's a race to power for the, those big companies, as you mentioned. Exactly. And, and you see the competition more and more. Um, you know, for example, Google is competing with the Chinese companies, Baidu and, uh, and those kinds of companies. Yeah, so you're, you're um, um, leaning on uh, of a power or leadership from corporation rather than talking about leadership between countries. That's more um, what it I, 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 am, I, th I think corporations will take the lead, but, but I see sort of um, the, the power of technology as such that, that you will see sort of much more development in this phase in, in sort of the underdeveloped parts of the world. And, and they will be kind of serious kind of stakeholders. That's interesting. So as you say, you know, we are experiencing many changes 
socially, but also, of course, in our work. So what kind of changes do you think Gen Z and the millennials will bring for the future? So, so first, you know, uh, uh, the notion of, of uh, 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 the work kind of having an impact on society, on, on the environment is something that is very kind of front and, and central for Gen Zs and the, and the millennials. So they're not just working, you know, to make money. Um, the, the, there's a lot of, I think, interesting characteristics. You know, the, um, the, the new kind of workforce is hyper-connected, you know, was born with a kind of mobile phone in their hand. And, and so they don't want to kind of go and work in a, in a place which is kind of 30 years back. They are looking for very different work experiences. They also kind of think very differently about sort of their career. They're, they're not going to spend the next 20, 30 years slowly moving up the ladder. You, uh, you'll see sort of they tend to multitask. They, they like to work in parallel. Um, you know, uh, whatever your opinion about the gig economy is, um, you are going to see sort of the gig economy expand and gig type of work expand. Um, the Gen Z millennials don't want to be robots. They don't want to come and do repetitive manual work. So, so, so you'll see sort of they want to be part of decision making. They want to have flatter organizations. So it's going to drive a significant change to old style corporations, which are very kind of hierarchical uh, in, in the way they are built. That's right. Yeah, that's very interesting, really. And they want purpose also in, in their work. Thank you so much, Ravi, for all your thoughts and uh, for participating here today on Startup Vision TV. And we hope to, to see you soon. Bye-bye. It's a pleasure, Florence. Thank you.